Hello guys, Winston here. A long time ago, in a season many months past, I alluded to something notionally called Project Malice. I mentioned it in a previous video, and you've seen glimpses of it on Instagram, but the entirety of it hasn't been revealed until now. This is what Project Malice actually is. A decked out, heavily modified nerf blaster that's the brainchild of Alice Coat Duck, maker and modder extreme from the land of Perpetual Winter and Maple Syrup, or something along those lines. This blaster is based on a rapid strike donor chassis with thoroughly reworked internals. For those of you who aren't familiar with Hasbro's nerf genealogy, this is what a stock rapid strike looks like. Alice put in a ton of mods for this blaster, including provisions for using 3S LiPo batteries, high-powered motors, 3D printed additions to the shell, this awesome almost automotive-esque paint job, and at its core, an all-aluminum flywheel cage that I machined on the Pocket NC. This is one of her designs, and although it's functionally identical to others that exist, the Malice cage is significantly lighter than any of the other aftermarket aluminum cages being produced, and it makes them all look rather Soviet. That is to say, like a cross between a T-34 tank and a brick. This structure looks like a work of art in comparison. Not only that, but the model is parametric, so flywheel spacing can be adjusted for the desired level of compression on a nerf dart. Now, for all its brilliance, machinability isn't exactly one of the Malice's strong suits. Most hobbyists will print or resin cast flywheel cages, but I really wanted to take this to the next level. I couldn't not machine it out of aluminum. And to do that, I figured the best way was with a 5-axis CNC. I've always been on the lookout for a really technical part to machine on the Pocket NC because I want to be a better machinist. The ability to bend Fusion 360 to your will, particularly with regards to 5-axis cam, is something that only practice will make faster and easier. When Alice approached me, I saw this as an excellent learning opportunity. I knew everything about this project was technically possible, but the large amount of non-flat surface area meant that I'd have to be conscientious about how I would apply 3D surfacing toolpaths. In previous videos, you saw me struggling just to figure out how to workhold this piece because it runs right up to the travel limits of the Pocket NC. Solving the stock workholding problem ended up being just a small fraction of the battle. Figuring out how I was going to machine this part while I removed more and more material from my stock was going to be far more challenging. I can only machine this flywheel cage in a vertical orientation. Every face needs to be touched, so window machining or using multiple tabs was out of the question. I could only afford one tab at the bottom, and it had to support the cage until the end. Containing my toolpaths to leave intact as much of that interface with the stock as I could until the last possible moment would be quite tedious, but I felt it was essential if I wanted a good looking part. My toolpath order changed a lot between my first and second prototypes, but the general gist of what I wanted to do was rough out material, leaving the base intact, finish as much as I could, and then whittle away at the bottom until only a tiny tab remained. I'm going to break from tradition and show you the details of the fusion side of things after showing you how machining the first article went. I learned so much along the way that my final fusion setup barely resembled the first try. Here's how prototype 1 went down. I first started by facing down the top of my stock to the model's positive Y face. This is the best orientation to use to finish the top of the cage. Next, I started contouring around the perimeter of my part with about 15 thou of stock to leave. This would save me from having to machine the entire volume of the stock block away, which would add hours to the project. I was hoping I would be able to machine through the entire profile of the cage and have the chunks of excess stock fall away freely once separated. Unfortunately, when I was cutting through the final layer, this happened. Yeah, that was a pucker moment for sure when my stock basically imploded. From that point on, I made sure to enable tabs on all my contours and broke off my excess stock manually. From there, I started roughing. Front, back, motor wells. While the stock was still really strong, I finished the back face. This side presents the greatest area of flat surface that's going to be visible, so it's important to machine that first. Then I got to work on the barrel area. First, I made some clearance so that chips could evacuate by gravity. Then I machined out the bore of the cage, or at least as much as I could with standard length tooling. This model is just under 2 inches wide, so to properly clear out that cavity would require some specialized tooling, and Harvey Tool really came through for me. They sent me their 919408-C8 cutter, which is the longest reach 8th inch tool I could find among the vendors that I frequent. It's got stub flutes for strength, a relieved shank to prevent chip rubbing, and it's coated. I ran it about 25% more conservative than my usual aluminum recipe because of rigidity concerns, but the tool did its job flawlessly. 
which is good because I only had one of these end mills to work with. Next, I bored out any through holes in the model with a 2mm end mill. Then I finished the front face of my cage. The motor bulkheads which are flat on top were finished head on with an 8th inch cutter, but the rest of that side was contoured which is what gives the part its beauty, but it also made my job more annoying. I decided to attack this problem using a parallel toolpath oriented horizontally relative to the part. The selective application of toolpaths in 5 axis is something I think really brings out the beauty of a machine part. Anyone can drown a part in 3D toolpaths and hope for the best, but careful segmentation and orientation of your finishing toolpaths is almost an art. I attacked the front face including the chamfer with a parallel toolpath and everything seemed to be going well until I got to the infeed guide. Here there's a fillet I told Alice to make at least a sixteenth of an inch in radius, that is the critical minimum value needed to allow for an eighth inch tool to match the part's profile, but really it should have been a little larger than that. When my end mill dove into that area of the part, it wasn't engaging the stock at just a single point, it was contacting around a much larger portion of its circumference. That sudden increase in engagement caused a ton of chatter. Ideally, your internal corner should be at least 20% larger than your cutter radius, but with my part already roughed out, there was no way to change that fillet size. I gritted my teeth and used feed rate override to manually slow down the cutter every time I plunged into a high engagement corner. And with the small step over I had programmed, this happened again and again and again. Feed optimization would help in this situation, but I didn't get that enabled and dialed in until later. Also, I goofed on my parallel finishing parameters because my ball end mill was allowed to dive into the holes that had been machined in the previous operation, and that caused spikes in cutter engagement as I bit into the material all around the hole. That was another bad shatter moment that I knew I had to fix in the future. After parallel finishing from the front, I also continued the same parallel finish around the feeder lip. This way, the direction of the surface texture would be consistent all around the infeed guide. I came at it from some non-orthogonal angles and played around with the pass direction in order to ensure that all the machining marks would be parallel. Next, while I still had the ball end mill installed, I established the fillet around the base of the flywheel well. Next, I used a chamfer tool to, unsurprisingly, chamfer the back of my part and also establish the countersinks in the model. This one's a Datron tool that goes to a perfect point so you can chamfer around really small radii. Then I engraved the requisite logo and text on this part. To machine the logos on the curved faces, I used a trace operation. Even though it's under the 2D operations dropdown in Fusion, it will follow any line even if it's wrapped around 3D geometry, however, the tool orientation will remain fixed. If you want the tool to remain perpendicular to the surfaces being machined, you should probably try a multi-axis contour. I threw the Autodesk logo on top since I was using this as my entry in the Autodesk Cam Challenge way back when, and then I started my final batch of operations with an 8th inch flat end mill. I finished the back of the mounting tabs with a pocketing operation and then used a 3D contour to clean up the profile. Then I started hacking away at the base. I made some clearance with constrained pocketing operations, then cleaned up the faces I could reach with contour operations. Once I was left with nothing but the chunky stump of a tab, I used a 2D adaptive constrained to work within a narrow rectangle to whittle away at that support. Coming in from both ends, I was eventually left with a single fragile tap, the holy grail of 5-axis parts that I always see on Instagram. I'll admit, I spent a good chunk of time admiring this part. But I wasn't done yet, I needed to make a second part because at the end of this project both Alice and I would have one. And taking into account everything I learned from the first article, I made numerous changes to my cam. First off, I did a better job of grouping my operations by tool. This would minimize tool changes and also let me front load all of my roughing. That way, I could swap in a brand new cutter when it came time to finish the part. Another improvement I made to my process was to increase the radius around the infeed guide to address the cutter engagement issues from before. I also changed my approach angle of the parallel toolpath from the back to keep the ball and mill off the walls of the part. This way, the contour toolpath later could define the wall finish. And lastly, I tweaked the toolpaths around the bottom of the part because there had been multiple times where my end mill had been leading in or out through unmachined stock and it was causing horrible grinding noises. Thankfully, it never caused any missed steps. The second prototype was significantly less stressful to machine and it came out great. At least, that's how this story would end if it was happily ever after. But to pretend that this project was pulled off without any major drama would be entirely disingenuous, because during the machining of these two parts, I ran into an electrical fault that messed with my pocket NC's logic, causing a crash.
The folks at Pocket NC were super responsive though and helped me through the issue, which was likely a short circuit caused by chip ingress into a connector that hadn't been properly sealed. But by then, the damage had been done. On the home stretch of machining the last prototype, the machine took an unscheduled detour and took a bite out of my part. It wasn't catastrophic, but it was a noticeable cosmetic blemish. What was most frustrating about this was that I was so close to finishing a flawless part, but this crash happened 20 minutes before my toolpath was scheduled to finish. This project ended up being far more challenging than I anticipated, and some of those difficulties I expected. I knew I would probably spend way more hours thinking through my cam than I'd budgeted, and I did by, like, a factor of three. I suspected that the work envelope of the pocket and seat would be a challenge, and it was, though it required way more creativity to overcome than I'd thought. And then there was the electrical fault that I ran into, which I was able to overcome with the help of the Pocket NC team, but it still set me back several days and it denied me the flawless victory I had so desperately wanted. As a professional hobby machinist and content creator, I really hate having to put a project on hold, and I also feel terrible about the gaps in my video upload schedule. But these stress points are self-inflicted. If you have to step away from a project, there's bound to be something else you can work on in the meantime. And if you miss a week of uploads, or in my case, a month of uploads, it's not the end of the world. Accepting setbacks and working through them is something I've been trying really hard to be better at. Had I known how many hours I'd end up putting into this project, I might not have said yes to it. But still, the end results and flaws are all something I'm super proud of and I feel a renewed sense of confidence about my ability to wrap my head around a 5-axis project. And of course, my 5-axis journey was only part of the story. There's also the whole nerf blaster that this part goes into, which is an awesome piece to behold on its own. If you want to see how Alice designed and built this cool blaster, I'll have a link to her video in the usual places. I'm really happy that this collab happened because getting to see Alice's approach to design was actually a bit of a wake-up call to me. Her use of parameters, the way she creates organic shapes from 2D sketches, the way her brain subconsciously picks up on the design tricks of the toy industry. If you want to become a better designer, a CAD modeler, or just be more creative, find someone who makes something that you don't. It's the best way to be exposed to new techniques. Additionally, she helped me design the logo for the launch of a CNC Crasher t-shirt, which I'd been brainstorming by myself for a couple months now. If you're interested in one, hit up the link down below. I personally like being brutally honest about my hobby, and we all know you can't trust someone who says they've never broken an end mill before. I want to thank you all very much for watching, and I'll be back soon with some good old 3-axis CNC content soon.